What makes a game a cult classic? Realistically, there's probably as many different reasons as there are different games, but I've narrowed it down to two big ones. The first, and pff, most obvious one, you take an awesome, well-made game that in every right should have garnered the same love, attention, and success as the Mario, Sonics, and GTAs of the world, but just didn't. Usually due to crap marketing, or you know, no marketing at all, not being what's in at the time, or just simply being overshadowed by bigger releases. The other type of cult classic features games that undeniably have some major issues with them, but absolutely hit differently. Escaping the norms of the times in ways that most can't, or at the very least couldn't, really appreciate at the time of the game's release. Darker themes, less than brand safe designs, or just overwhelming challenges are all commonplace here. So, with that in mind, what camp do you think Chalkin' the Forever Man falls in? I can tell it's gonna be the first one. I just, I just know these things. Released for the Sega Genesis in 1992 with a port for the Sega Game Gear, though we'll be focusing exclusively on the Genesis version here, Chalkin' the Forever Man, based on the comic of the same name, is the tale of an absolute badass swordsman who was so unstoppable with a blade that even death itself couldn't stand against him. Boy, death, I want a word with you. But when you're stuck with Pirates of the Caribbean style immortality, and this life, uh, it, it, it kind of sucks. And death being a sore loser and all, won't just let it end for our hero. At least, not until he's destroyed all supernatural evil. Everywhere. Which is the basic setup of the game. And while most gamers, both back when the game launched and now, often don't really care about the story in these kind of classic action games, the scenario itself does bring up a few, um, let's just say inconsistencies with the gameplay that we will absolutely be bringing up as we get to them. So as the game kicks off, we find ourselves in the Plains of Darkness, which might as well just be a Mega Man stage select on legs. Pick a corner, go through the door, see the scenario, and off you go. There's no mandatory order to do the stages in, but it's also not as straightforward as your average level select screen either. Every stage is made up of three parts, and you are booted back to the hub world after you beat each one, which is actually pretty useful, as the first area of each stage opens up Chalkin's arsenal, which he needs in order to progress through most of the later stages. Not to mention, if you're struggling with one stage, you can just drop it for a while and go conquer another. That is, until you get stuck on all of them, and then you can just turn the console off. Look, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Chalkin is not an easy game, and definitely not for the right reasons. If you can't handle frustrating, obnoxious difficulty, run, then this game is not for you. But if you think I'm just exaggerating for dramatic effects, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've been warned. Despite how it may look, Chalkin is not your typical platformer. While every stage does have a starting point and end point, the game isn't exactly linear. The end of the stage isn't always on the opposite side of the map, so you're going to spend a lot of time just searching on where to go with lots of different paths to consider, with plenty of them just being dead ends. Not helped by the fact that it's rarely ever clear about what you actually have to do to complete a stage. But those first few areas do set a precedent. At the start, Chalkin is rocking his dual swords, which he can do basic strikes with, position in any direction, and what I imagine most of us will be using them for, a spinning bladed double jump. This is Sega's answer to the screw attack. The first areas of the main four stages end when you find the new weapons. A grappling hook, battle axe, scythe, and sludge hammer, which you can cycle through with the A button. But let's talk about those weapons, shall we? Of the lot, the grappling hook is the most self-explanatory and easily the most useful. It also controls just like the swords and is the only other weapon with the spin jump. The axe, scythe, and sludge hammer all work and feel pretty much exactly the same with more limited movements, but also doing more damage. 
Their main purpose seems to be for clearing obstacles in your way and opening up different paths to explore. Though, it's a bit excessive. Like, the axis needed to break through these wooden doors, but I'm pretty sure a sledgehammer can pull off the same feat. Or the scythe is for slashing through webs, but I'm pretty sure any pointy object would do the trick. And besides, despite all these cool weapons, it's only the swords that work with Chaken's coolest mechanic. Alchemy. Damn you, equivalent exchange. Scattered throughout the stages are bottles of chemicals, which come in four different flavors. And you can carry up to four of each on you at any given time. Now alone, none of them actually do anything. But mixing and matching them gives you a handful of really cool effects. Fire, electricity, uh, blue fire, all kind of act the same way. Utilizing projectiles, great for making short work of tougher enemies. Bombs, increased jump height, slowing foes, and healing are all pretty self-explanatory, though not all of the power-ups are. The game offers up invincibility, which again, pretty self-explanatory, but what I couldn't figure out is why I'd want invisibility over invincibility. But hey, I'm not complaining. Though the alchemies that I really want to spotlight are these two. First, and my personal favorite, is creating a passage, or the equivalent of making your own checkpoint in the stage, which obviously is super useful, as when you die, you get booted from the area, and using this prior lets you jump back into the fray without having to navigate the stage again, over and over and over. Basically, it's a built-in save state mechanic. Love it. Which on that note, I need, I need to mention that Chaken does not have any saves or passwords, but you do have infinite lives, so the game only ends when you beat it, or it beats you. But either way, it'll be in one sitting as it's not that long. I'm pretty sure that it's actually one of those games that were made brutally difficult on purpose in order to extend the playtime by killing you over and over and over again. I think you know the type. Now, if you didn't notice this icon down at the bottom and put two and two together already, every stage is timed, but probably not in the way you'd expect. And it breaks the game on just so many levels and it sucks. Basically, despite every zone being broken into three parts, the time you have to beat them all carries over, and yes, you guessed it, run out of time, even if it's during the boss fight in Area 3, it's back to square one. Now, the last piece of alchemy that I mentioned earlier does actually help with this by letting you flip the hourglass to circumvent this problem a bit, but it's not enough. The further you get in the game, the scarcer potions become, and you're not exactly guaranteed to find the combination needed for a time flip. And you do not have a lot of time. And as I said, they don't exactly telegraph where to go or how to beat them. After the first set of stages where you find the weapons, how you complete later stages can really just be up in the air. Some stages you find a floating emblem similar to the weapons, but some stages have you take out a certain enemy. Problem is... How would you know that? Kill them all. Okay, yeah, I like that plan. You, you do mean in the game, right? This stage is the shining example. In order to beat it, you have to wipe out this upside down octopus monster. But aside from being gravity challenged, it's no different than any of the other ones in the stage that I just skipped over. Because seriously, there is no incentive to fight these things while the clock is ticking. In fact, the game kind of encourages you to avoid, well, pretty much everything. If the clock is ticking, why bother exploring? If the enemies are slowing me down, why fight them? Especially when, more times than not, death will be your only reward. Even though you're immortal. How does that work? While well, I haven't read the Chaken comics myself, the game tells me that Chaken is basically immortal. So how am I dying so much? <clears throat> Stop that. No. Bad. And honestly, I actually wouldn't have had an issue with the clock if that's how they chose to skirt around the whole immortal thing. But no. Whether it be from the enemies or the level design itself, this sound will constantly be ringing in your ears. It's more than just the cheapness of the enemies. 
The controls, the collision, the poor level design all band together to be the greatest challenges you will face in this game. Despite his wide range of movements, like the corpse that he is, Chalkin just feels stiff. Particularly with the double jump, which is absolutely necessary for pretty much all of the platforming. And let me tell you, it is infuriating, just infuriating, when you slam that jump button and nothing happens. But probably even more so, when you do get it to happen, and then you can't even land on your target in the first place. The collision in this game is just wonky, to say the least. You will be clipping through floors and enemies at the weirdest, and of course, most inconsistent times. Plus, when you're up against walls, and half the time when you're trying to go up and down hills, Chakin will become the forever stuck man. Or at least for a few moments. On top of plenty of other little issues that just add up to make a very frustrating experience. Really, there's just too many to count. But even if you fixed and forgave those bugs, it doesn't help with the level design. Chalkin expects a lot of faith from the player, particularly with leaps of faith. Yeah, good luck with that. On top of the fact that you are absolutely expected to search all around the stage for the correct path, which includes downwards. It's pretty much inevitable that you're going to find yourself at the bottom of a pit. Or maybe you'll just end up passing through an invisible wall. And look, I know that a lot of platformers use invisible walls. Hell, Mario and Sonic both do it. But at least in their games, they indicate that it's a thing. Early on in Chalkin, you have to pass through an invisible wall just to continue. And I honestly only found it by pure accident. Because I was fighting with the controls. And speaking of fighting, let's talk about those enemies. Starting with the first enemy in the final stage of the ice area. You see that? Here it is again. That's right, if you don't slam the jump button before the stage loads, you're taking a hit. Like, how would anyone know to do that their first time in? It's so cheap! And a lot of the enemies are like that. From endlessly respawning baddies that like to just buzz around you, to foes that attack from weird angles, most enemies just being below your average attack range, long invincibility frames, the combat is just more of a chore than it is a challenge. You end up just wanting everything to just get out of your way. And the boss fights do not save it. They are just very flat feeling, barely animated PNGs that like to scamper around. Despite how cool they look, I rarely if ever realized that half of them were bosses in the first place. Which is disappointing since besides that, this game looks great. I asked earlier about what type of cult classic game Chalkin is. And how you categorize it may differ, but I really do get why this game is considered a cult classic. I mean, just look at it. The stages are awesome. The ruins of an underwater temple, a bug infested cavern, a molten dragon's nest, just to name a few. All of the stages have a dark, eerie, and ancient otherworldly atmosphere. It gives the game a real sense of identity, even today. And the music is pure Genesis. Very gritty and almost tribal sounding, with an air of menace. Sometimes gearing more towards an unsettling ambience than actual music. It's a real flip of the coin for me though, as some of it can get very grating, especially when you hear it over and over again after dying so much. But it most certainly fits the mood. It is easy to see how those who grew up with this game could effortlessly spend their entire weekends just playing it over and over until they mastered it, finding the perfect route, rationing their potions just right. Chalk and the Forever Man has style, it has edge, and is overall just a really cool game. The source material seems pretty badass, and even without it, the concept and visuals go hard. This is a game just begging for a worthy remake. And while there was a tech demo for the Dreamcast, that never saw the light of day. So as it stands, despite how badass this game seems, the gameplay just pulls it down with an ungodly combination of cheap and broken mechanics. It is a relic of the past. Best left to the hardest of hardcore, gluttons for punishment, and those who drank the Kool-Aid. Oh yeah!